let's get started with this. So, new class structure, Bucks Historical Longsword. So, why are we here? We're here because I've been planning some big changes for the club. I don't want to leave anybody in the dark. Um, I don't want people wondering why everything is super different from uh, from when they left off and being off put by it. So that's why I'm doing this. And also, I was hoping to get some beginners in here to, you know, get them oriented a little bit. But I guess that's not going to happen. Maybe they can watch the video. So why are we changing? Why why have I decided to uh, change our club structure? So, the old structure was basically based on um, the structure of a kendo class because that's what I knew. Um, that was, you know, obviously what I came from when I started HEMA. And, you know, it worked. Um, so, I yeah, sometimes I joked that I, I was teaching uh, kendo with a KDF paint job. I think over time that shifted more towards the uh, KDF, but uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, so I knew that that style worked. Um, it works for kendo uh, and produces, you know, good fencers. Be people get good at kendo, so, you know, there's evidence that it works. Um, so why am I changing? Because I read books about coaching and um, I started to, and I decided to kind of, um, well, it seemed like the evidence was mounting that maybe there's a better way, basically, is, is what I'm getting at. And, um, yeah, the pandemic is really what is allowing for this to take place, because when I have, like, when you have a class that you need to prepare for every single week, um, you know, without without any any kind of breaks or or you know any kind of long break, then you can't really make um, large sweeping changes. You can only kind of make you know small tweaks here and there. So having a, having a long break really enables us to um, kind of restructure from the ground up. Um, so was the old class structure bad? No, I don't think it is. I think that the old class structure was was fine, but I mean, you know, you, you can you can tell. You know, we have we have people who have improved quite a bit since we've started, but that doesn't mean we can we can't do better. So here is you know our attempt to do better. So the core. Um, you know, the overall driving force of the change is going to be a shift from technique-based to tactics-based teaching. And what that means is, so basically, you know, technique is an action that you do. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a specific movement. And a tactic is a way in which you use a movement. So, for example, a technique would be like an Oberhau or like a Zverhau. Um, you know, the, the actual cut itself. The tactic would be like direct attack. So, you know, you, you use the technique in order to carry out your tactical decision, whatever, whatever that may be. Um, so how does this, how do you, how does this translate to teaching? So, um, the, the way that we've done it before and the way Kendo did it and a lot of, you know, other martial arts and, you know, other sports also do it this way is technique based, which means you learn the movement first and you try to get really good at it, like in a vacuum. So for example, you know, we practice our cuts, we, uh, we partner up and we practice our overhouse, um, against, you know, a compliant partner and we try to get really good at using them and the idea is that if you get really good at doing the move then you'll have no problem doing it you know applying it to like sparring or a tactical situation um so the uh 
the, the opposite or like <laughs> the, the, the tactics way of doing it would be rather than first learning the movement you start with the tactical situation and in order to do that you create a um, a game basically and the game is structured in such a way that the solution is the thing that you want to learn. So instead of being told the right way to do a movement and having that you know all prescribed to you and then practicing it in a, in a vacuum where you get no context, you get the context right away and the person naturally learns the the movement based on um, you know how the how the drill or game is set up. So um, and that's like that's closer to how people like actually like naturally learn things. Uh, at least that's what you know all the, uh, the the books have been saying about it. So. Um, there are some things that people. So I'll I'll go over some some things that uh, people say that, um, you know, to kind of defend the technique based learning, at least when I was like learning kendo and you know things that we tell beginners to, um, I guess motivate them to keep going. One is that um, you need to practice the technique in order to uh, get rid of bad habits. So, you know, that's fine in theory, you know, you'll, you'll practice the technique more and more and you'll smooth it out and, you know, you'll, you'll get rid of all your bad habits uh, before you enter the chaos of sparring. However, in reality, um, people, ha people end up with bad habits anyway in kendo. So, people, like, you know, in everything really. Um, but kendo is like the example I'm using. So people still end up with bad habits even after, you know, drilling for six months before being able to spar at all. Um, and, you know, maybe you, you can make the argument that, like, they would have even more bad habits if the other way was around, if it was the other way around, but I, I don't think that's really a strong argument. And, you know, you could also say the opposite. Maybe they would have... Um, Maybe practicing the technique in a vacuum is causing more bad habits because you're not doing the technique like you'll do it when you're sparring. So bad habits, I don't think, is a good argument. Um, so the other thing that's kind of um, a crack in the paint when it comes to technique-based is and this is kind of like something that, that was commonly accepted um, as normal, um, is when you do start sparring, uh, people will report that uh, everything they've learned has gone out the window, and it's like they're starting fresh. And like, so someone, someone in kendo, you know, they've been doing kendo for like five or six months, they get into Bogu and they're like, oh man, this is crazy. It's like, I've never, you know, done Kendo before. And everyone's like, yeah, I know, right? Isn't it awesome? Like, it's great. And just like it's normal. But like, that's really not good. You know, that means the stuff that you've been learning over the past six months hasn't been like entirely useful. So, you know, you don't want, you don't want to waste your time. <laughs> basically, you don't want to waste your time learning stuff that you're not going to be able to apply to, um, like a, uh, a fencing situation. Uh, do I have anything else on this? Yeah, um, I also want to uh, add a disclaimer at some point, I guess I'll do it now, that um, although there is a lot of evidence to, to back up, you know, this style of learning, I personally don't have experience, um, you know, learning or teaching using this style. So, you know, you'll have to, uh, kind of, we'll have to kind of, uh, 
roll with the punches and you know let it work itself out for a little bit. It's not, it's probably not going to be perfect right away. If it is, I'll be very surprised. Um, there will be some things that we have to smooth out. All right, I guess that's enough for this. Move on. All right, what about history? So you may ask yourself, we're we're, we're uh, you you may have watched the video of all the drills, and you may be thinking to yourself. Um, so that's great that you know you're learning all this, all of these tactical things and you know things that involve fencing. You know what to do when fencing and whatever. But where is the history? Where's where are the historical techniques? Because that's what we're here to learn is the historical techniques. So I want to assure everybody that we're still going to do historical fencing at Buck's Historical Longsword. Um, based on the RDL uh, glosses. Um, and I think it'll be even better. And here's why. So in the glosses, there's there's two kind of, uh, you know, main categories of text. There's the pieces, or like the, the techniques, you know, whatever you want to call them, the stuk, which are, you know, set piece plays that show things to do. Uh, with the sword. And then there's advice, which is often, uh, you know, strategic advice. So strategic advice, you know, we can take that into account, you know, in all, it, this won't change anything, the new, with, with, with strategy. Um, the, the new style has nothing to do with whether or not you apply the, um, well, it does have something to do, but it has no bearing no difference in bearing on whether or not you apply the strategic advice of the glosses. That was just as much in the uh, the old way as it is in the new. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, now the techniques. So really what the techniques are, are solutions to tactical problems. So if you don't understand the tactical problem in the first place, then you're not going to be able to apply the solution. So basically, you know, what, what I think is that this is going to, like starting from the tactics, um, is, is going to actually make it easier to learn, you know, the, uh, the pieces because you'll understand why they're supposed to be used and, you know, then you'll learn it. Learning them Learning the pieces is the easy part. Understanding when to use them is the difficult part. So I think starting from tactics will make it easier. Um, so I also have uh, leash and hour goggles written here. And what that means is, I, I think um, I think Jake Norwood uh, coined that term. So basically, you know, when you're watching two people fence, like, how do you know like what what what's what what's the practical difference between someone doing historical fencing and someone doing you know modern fencing with long swords or you know something made up or even something from a different tradition like fiore or whatever um like as an external viewer of of uh, someone else fencing you know it might be difficult to tell you know some of the you can say like you know they do they do this technique instead of that technique or whatever, but a lot of the techniques look pretty similar, especially you know as since things can be interpreted differently, and you know you have the chaos of a full speed fencing situation. So the difference, you know, according to the least an hour goggles idea, the difference is how you categorize things in your head, like how you classify. Um, everything that you're doing. So are you viewing a, a, an exchange in terms of like four knock, strong, weak, and indus? You know, are you, when you see a blade taking, are you considering that like a winding or, and like using it in, you know, the, in the way that they say to use the windings in the book, you know, etc. So if we, if we view fencing through leash and hour goggles, then, you know, we can kind of push our way closer to, you know, fencing in a historical way. 
Um, so yeah, history not going not going anywhere. Um, we're not going to do story time anymore though, because I'm pretty sure everything in story time just went in one ear and out the other. I think it was just like a break for people. Um, and we can take breaks uh, without doing story time. So sorry for anybody who's going to miss that. Okay, so moving on, what will the new, what will all this look like? The new, what will the new class structure entail? So basically, um, we want people to play the game. We want people to be exposed to the game of fencing as soon as possible, because that's how you learn. You know, um, you open. Well, okay. Say you you want to learn like a new board game. You're with somebody else who already knows it. Are you gonna Are you gonna have them read every single rule to you, and then expect to play it perfectly the first time? Probably not. You'll read just as you'll have them read just as much as you need to get started, and then you'll just start playing and figure out the rest of the rules as you go. So that's what we want to do. Um, luckily, there's not really any um, prerequisites. So some in some sports, there's like prerequisites to get to like you know have a baseline of starting to play the game. For example, like in ice ice hockey, you need to be able to ice skate. But thankfully, in um, long sword fencing. Anybody can pick up a buffer and like already automatically knows how to hit somebody in the head with it. So you have enough <laughs> you have enough prerequisite um, you know motor skills to start playing the game. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have people start right away. Um, after a warm up, we're gonna do sparring. Um, so what that'll look like. Uh, Will depend on you know your experience level. For beginners, if it's their first time, you know we'll go through like the safety, like the safety talk and overview. You know what what equipment you need. You know don't brain people in the head. You know all that good stuff. Um, and then they'll go through like a guided lesson. So for example, like if I'm teaching somebody who's, if I'm sparring with somebody who's who's never held a sword before, you know, I'll have them put on their gear, give them a buffer, and go up against them and basically uh, put my sword down and say, like, hit me. And have them, like, hit me in the head a couple times, just to kind of get a feel for hitting another human. And then I'll slowly start to add resistance. So I'll start to, you know, parry sometimes um, and, you know, kind of start to present, you know, different basic problems to them. Um, all the while, I'm not really giving them any specific advice on form or anything. I'm just letting them, you know, hit me however is natural to them and come up with their own solutions to, you know, whatever problems. So, like, if I, you know, start parrying, maybe they'll, you know, figure out that they can't hit me here anymore, they have to hit me here, or, you know, etc. So that's something that's that's going to take, and, and I expect um, experienced members to also be able to, to do this um, with, with new people. So that's kind of be, you know, kind of a responsibility that experienced people have that maybe they didn't before when we were just doing the big rotation. Um, so, you know, and after the first class or so, um, they won't have to do like the, you know, a super handholdy version of sparring. They'll be able to, you know, go at it a little bit more uh, with a little bit more freedom. Um, so for experienced people, um, for the warm-up sparring, you know, you can go with your, you know, as I said before, you can help a beginner or you can go with a peer and spar at like a lower intensity because we're still getting warmed up and with a focus on awareness. So what I mean by awareness is, um, 
basically is your idea of how you're fencing in your head does that reflect is that reflected by reality does that match reality so um, for example maybe you think that you know maybe maybe your idea of your fencing is that you go for head attacks you know 50% of the time and you know hand snipes 30% of the time because you know, you are you want to be an honorable fencer and go for deep targets. But in reality, maybe you go for hand snipes 60% of the time and, you know, head strikes maybe 30% of the time. Um, you know, that's just, that's just one specific example. Or maybe you use a certain tactic more than you think. So kind of approach this first sparring from a... Uh, from a standpoint of like, what am I actually doing? Because uh, that's where you're, that's where you're going to be able to improve. So you, you need to be able to identify what you need to work on um, in order to select the right drills uh, in the next phase. So actually a quick example of um, awareness thing. It's not 100% the same, I guess, but I was talking on the HEMA Discord um, about Martin Fabian, and I, I, I thought, uh, I know he, he fences left foot forward a lot, which, you know, I'm a big fan of. I, I'm a big proponent of fencing left foot forward, so I used him as, as an example. He, like I said, like he switches between left and right foot forward, and I said he probably, uh, about half the time, he fences left foot forward, and someone else challenged me on that. He said, no, he's, he's usually right foot forward. Um, he almost never goes left foot forward. So I opened up one of his videos of like his, his compilation, one of his compilations of like all of his exchanges in, um, you know, the Pardu Bise tournament, um, which is his latest one. And I went through each exchange and I counted, um, whether I, I, uh, yeah, I picked for each exchange whether he engages with the left foot forward or the right foot forward. And it turns out that um, pretty consistently throughout tournaments, um, he's left foot forward about 20% of the time. Which is less than I thought, but more than the other guy thought. Um, so, just, uh, I guess, a little tangent. But yeah, awareness. Be aware of what you're doing. Um, so after that... After the uh, warm-up sparring, we'll you know transition into the drills. So, um, if you've seen the video that I made with Connor, the, the series of videos, you'll see some examples of those drills. So, um, a lot of them are uh, competitive, which means both sides have a win condition. And as I said, as I was talking about before in the uh, you know, the tactical uh, focused idea. Um, the solutions won't be prescriptive. There'll just be a goal that you need to achieve and, you know, different parameters. And um, in order to achieve that goal, you should be guided in the direction of the, uh, the kind of thing that we're supposed to be practicing. So once you do find a solution, um, if you want to work on it in isolation, or if you want to like improve your movement, you can isolate that move and do reps of it. So that that kind of like um, you know drilling reps of a particular movement doesn't go away. It just shifts from the main focus to something you do once you've already figured out what to do. Because now as you're doing reps of the movement you understand exactly why you're doing that movement and it will you know lead you more to um, an efficient and, and correct um, you know execution theoretically at least that's what they that's what the studies say um, so I mentioned before no more uh, big rotation so basically everybody's going to be able to, you know, pick their own thing, pick their own drills that, that they want to work on. So you can, you know, group up 
in groups of like uh, probably three. Three is a good number because then one person is uh, two people do the drill, one person sits out, and if the uh, drill has priority or something, then the person who's sitting out can uh, judge. Um, or either way, the person sitting out can judge because now we're learning judging too, which is good. Um, so, how do you decide what drills to do? So, this is kind of the progression that I was thinking of. So, start with what you need to work on. Um, if you don't know what you need to work on, um, or you really want to work on something else, then uh, drill what you want to do. If you can't think of either of those, um, you don't know what you want to do and you don't know what you need to do, then help somebody else. So somebody else might know what they want to do or need to do. So just go partner with them and do their drill. Um, and if no one um, in the entire class knows what's going on or anything, then just spar. Spar a little bit more until you figure it out. Um, so, uh, with beginners, it's kind of the same deal. Um, they'll just do more, you know, drills uh, focused on, like, tactical basics instead of uh, the more free, um, advanced kind of drills. All right, so then after that, it's just free practice, as usual, free sparring. Um, you know, you can spar however you want, high intensity, low intensity, you know, whatever your partner wants, just make sure you and your partner agreed on it. Um, you can also keep doing drills if you want, competitive drills or sparring games. Um, and I'll also give individual lessons during this time if people want to do individual lessons. And if you don't feel like sparring, then uh, do some judging practice. So find, uh, or if you're tired or whatever, if you don't feel like sparring or you're really tired and you know you can't spar, then find two people who are fencing and just judge their match. Um, because judging is good practice. So I, I really want to integrate like judging ideas more into our practice. So, you know, the better... Being a good judge means that you understand what's going on in the exchange. And that's that's something that I would really like to, um, to push more, is understanding of what's going on in the exchange. Um... Let's see if I have anything else to say on this. Okay, so for drills, um, I guess I should mention that not all the drills need to be competitive. So we we can still do, um, you know, um, what's the word? I guess I'll just say non-competitive. So a competitive drill, both sides uh, have a win condition, um, or you can have a non-competitive drill in which one side takes the role of the coach and the other side is the student and the coach's job is to kind of set up the correct situation for the student. So um, I guess the difference is we'll reserve those for like more advanced like decision drills. So say you you know you want to do something where you attack and then bind, uh, and then you have like maybe five different options, uh, which sounds like a lot. But if you uh, if you design it correctly, it's doable. Um, then you can have you know the student coming in and the coach needs to create the right sequence of situations um, for each possible de decision. So we can still have those. Um, yeah. Competitive drills and sparring games, um, there can be a fine line between them, and I was kind of trying to get um, a good, like, hard and fast de definition for what is a competitive drill and what is a sparring game, and um, I kind of came up dry on that, so competitive drills slash sparring games and non-competitive drills. Um, okay. All right, moving on. So cueing is is a um, is kind of a coaching idea that uh, I mean this is more pertains to me, but 
like as the instructor, but I think it's good for everybody to know because we're always um, eager to give each other tips uh, when we're when we're uh, practicing, which is good. You know, you want to be able to help each other, but um, you want you want to help the you want to be able to help each other in a productive way. So um, something I'm sure this has happened to everybody is they're you know trying to do reps of like a tech. Well, I don't know if it's happened to everybody, but it's happened to me for sure. Um, you're trying to do like repetitions of like a technical drill, um, trying to get like a movement perfectly, and after each rep, your coach, you know, tells you five things that you that you need to fix with like your form. Like, oh, you're not you're not squeezing enough with your fingers. You need to power it with your left hand. Um, you need to drive yourself like drive your hips forward, you know, with your attack. You know, whatever, whatever the things. Um, that's that's extremely detrimental <laughs> to um, to learning. It's worse than useless to give people uh, we we call those uh, internal cues, um, and especially giving that many. Um, so basically, a cue is is what you want somebody to think about when they're like about to do a rep, which I have that written here. I just re I read it. Um, so this differs. This is different from like um, explaining something. So if you're explaining like the mechanics of something, um, you can talk about like muscle movement or whatever. But when you're giving somebody direction on how to execute something, you want your cues to be to always be external. So I have this example here. Um, so for the action of catching a ball that's thrown at you, the internal cue would be. Uh, move your arm so your hand is in front of the ball and then close your hand when the ball reaches it. If someone gives you that advice and you try to follow it um, when there's a ball coming at you, you probably won't catch it. However, if the person just says catch the ball, you'll have a much higher chance of actually catching it. Um, maybe you won't catch it right away, but after a few reps you'll be able to. Um, and it's just um, I don't want to go like too much into why this is, but basically, like our conscious mind is not what's telling our muscles to do all the things. And if we try to do that, then you know we'll be thinking about all of our muscle movements, and we won't be thinking about what to like what we're actually doing. So you need to feed the the conscious mind the goal that they're trying to achieve. And it's like your subconscious that figures out how to tell your muscles to do all the things that it needs to do. So feed the mind a goal uh, in the form of a cue, an external cue, and allow the person's subconscious to translate that into actual movement. Um, and um, give one cue at a time. So that's really all that... Um, all that somebody can use usefully handle is focusing on one thing at a time. So just give somebody one. Even if you notice like 10 things that they need to work on, pick the most important and you know come up with an external cue for that. Um, okay, practical considerations. So how are we going to uh, practically allow like beginners to spar? Um, the answer is foam swords. So we have I have a picture here. The top one is the the Polish go now, which I've ordered several of them. And the bottom is the Nihon Zashi uh, Geken sword. So both are you know minimal gear is needed for them. So anybody with a mask and gloves can um, immediately start sparring pretty much, <coughs> sorry, pretty much full speed. Um, so that solves the problem. Uh, I mean, they're not, they're not perfect. They're not 100% the same as steel. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but like uh, fine point work is is not as good with with the, with the uh, foam swords because uh, they're so wide. You know, they. Uh, 
get in the way of each other a little bit more. But as far as like learning all the ideas that we need to, uh, like all the tactical ideas, uh, they work perfectly fine. And you know, almost everything that you do with them will translate to steel. Um, I've sparred with these with uh, Connor and with Alan already, and you know we all agree that you know they're they're fine. Um, you can block with them, so like other boffers, like you know lighter boffers are not rigid enough, so you can't block with them. They just cut right through, or like that they bend. But these you can block with, um, and they're okay in thrust. They're not fantastic, but they're okay. Um, and also for uh, for people with steel, we'll be practicing outside. So when it's like 100 degrees and sunny, um, maybe we won't necessarily want to put all, all of our steel gear on so we can use these to uh, continue practicing. But yeah, foam is the solution to uh, making longsword accessible to everybody and we'll, we will be using it. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So this is all the sources so I keep mentioning like um, books that I read. This is a list of uh, some resources in case you want to check up and see if I'm lying or not, which is possible. Um, any questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I was in and out because um, I'm working on the. Uh, I'm working at the moment, but um, how uh, how would you incorporate the uh, the material from uh, from the glosses into the lessons? How how would uh, how would they be integrated exactly? So I did go over this uh, in the beginning. Let me go back to that slide. So basically, the, the drills that we're doing teach tactical situations, right? And the pieces that, that we get in the gloss um, are solutions to tactical situations. So really, what, we're, what we learn through the drills is the applications of the pieces from the... Uh, from the glosses. So the first thing that you might come up with may not be, you know, the thing from the gloss. It might also be, who knows, you might, you might figure something out that's, that's in there. Um, but if it's not, you can go to the gloss and, oh, I forgot to mention my, uh, <laughs> my um, reference system. So, um, yeah, this is important and very applicable to what you asked. So I'm, uh, kind of developing a uh, metadata reference system, um, which is pretty much a list of like common tactical ideas, and I'll attach one to. I went through the the lev gloss and attached one to each of the pieces. So like, for example, you know, um, Zornhau, the the uh, the tactical idea would be uh, counterattack with opposition or parry repost. So you can look at that and then look for drills that involve like counterattack with opposition and parry repost and um, you know try to apply the Zorn how to that to, to that, those that's drills. actually that's that's exactly how I pictured uh, everything being kind of folded in like you have um, you have a technique that demonstrates a, uh, a solution to a problem and then you practice drills involving that problem. Right. And then technique as you go. Yeah. Some of them are more obvious than others. Like, you know, we have the slicing drill. You know, the solution is obviously the slices directly out of the book. But some other things like the shield house is a little bit difficult to um, kind of uh, come across on your own. So you can kind of cross-reference back and forth from the book. And uh, after you've come up with your own solutions, um, try to incorporate the solutions that uh, Least an Hour would have come up with.
Any other questions? All right, so I know we're gonna be moving to more of a uh, foam medium. And you said you had uh, four of those, uh, the Polish ones, correct? Yeah. Okay, uh, is that something that you would want us to get on our own or like the, uh, the Anzashi ones, are they able to work for what we're doing? Yeah, the Nihon Zashi ones are, are good. So okay. I, I know you have them. I have a bunch of them too. So, um, you know, we'll definitely make use of them. I like the Polish ones a little bit better, but like the Nihon Zashi are still uh, pretty good. And we're not going to like, we're still going to use steel. You know, steel is still going to be the ultimate goal that, you know, everyone wants to do. Because steel is just too cool to eliminate. <laughs> and <It's> true. <laughs> it's also, I mean, there, there are differences. So... Actually, like, um, one thing with these, with, with the foam, is whenever you use these, one-handed attacks are not allowed because they're way too easy to do one-handed attack with, attacks with, way easier than steel. So if you get used to doing one-hand attacks with these and then you start using steel, you'll probably hurt your wrist or something if you try to do one-handed attack. So that will be gotcha. one restriction. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, these are cheap. Like, you can get one if you want, um, but you don't have to. The Nihon Zashi is fine, or just using steel is fine. Thanks. Thank you. Have you found a location, Steve, for um, your classes outside? Uh, yes, I, I picked a park that, that I like. Um, so it's, um, I don't know if you'll be familiar, but, uh, Taminen Park in Upper Southampton. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I saw that you mentioned, well, I know you mentioned a few of them I saw. So is that on the Facebook page, on the Bucks page then? I did. I mentioned it in passing on the Bucks page, but I haven't made like an official announcement yet. Okay. Um, which I'll do like this week because I want to get started probably the second week in May. I think I want to get started. Um, yeah, it's a nice park. It has a lot of, uh, it checks a lot of the boxes that I was looking for. So we'll see. Mm, okay. I mean, who knows how it'll go when we actually get started because you never know yeah. how people are going to react to a bunch of people, you know, swinging swords around. <laughs> but I'll have like a backup in, in place just in case, but I'm hoping that this one's going to be good. Yeah. Are we, are we still thinking uh, Friday, Friday nights then? Um, I'm planning on uh, Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays for classes. Oh, nice. We're outdoors, so, like, why not? Why not do, like, a bunch of classes instead of just one? Yeah, that's cool. I'm excited. Will classes still be about two hours or longer, shorter? What do you think, Ben? Um, I mean, the only real uh, limiting factor is, well, I guess A would be, you know, how long people are willing to stay out and B, when the sun goes down. So um, in the summer, you know, in the, in the late sun nights of the summer, you know, we can pretty much go like as late as we want. Um, I'm planning on starting class at six, but then we'll kind of run into problems for weeknights when we get to uh, daylight savings next year. So we'll see what we, uh, what options we have them then as far as, uh, going back to indoor classes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Can I ask a goofball question, Steve? Yeah, sure. Do we have a pandemic pub alternative? Um, I don't know. <laughs> not, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Actually, I don't think that's a goofball question. I think it's a very important question. It is. It is. Um, I mean, it you're not allowed off. to drink in public parks, so. <laughs> 
I don't know. We'll see. I just want to. I just want to get started, and then we'll figure out all the uh, important stuff. Stephen, uh, the, uh, I live about five minutes from Taminant, so uh, if we need an alternate uh, post-practice drinking site, I volunteer my backyard. <laughs> Hmm. We may just take you up on that. <laughs> hey, I got a barbecue. I got a backyard table. I also have uh, just about an acre of land uh, total front and back. So uh, we could get into some foam shenanigans. My neighbors are used to me having the kids out lightsaber dueling. My son and I practice with wood weapons uh, all the time. And uh, I still keep in practice for the fight choreography stuff I used to do with live steel. So nice. my neighbors are used to all sorts of that sort of thing. <laughs> Good. Um, actually, I've, I've got a question. You had mentioned before about uh, uh, one of the safety items, uh, the boffer swords have to be uh, uh, both hands so that way you get used to it. And so that way with steel, you're less likely to hurt your wrist. Good call. Um, what's the normal practice for injury prep? I mean, do we have someone that's an EMT? Do we, uh, um, do we have someone to make sure that, uh, uh, EMTs are on speed dial. Um, when I used to run a uh, fight choreography practice for some of the shows that I used to do, uh, my second in command was a uh, former military EMT. Uh, I had two paramedics uh, on my fight troop. And we also, everybody, I made sure that everybody had uh, the local emergency number on speed dial in case someone got hurt. Because playing with swords, you get hurt. <laughs> so right. what's what's the, uh, the prep that we have in place here? Well, um, that's a good question, and I'll admit that I haven't 100% um, planned for that. So, um, I mean, previously we were practicing in the gym, which, you know, we had uh, the, the um, you know, the staff of the gym was always there in case an emergency happened. We also have, you know, a lot of people with medical backgrounds in the club, um, so we've, you know, uh, we have Ashley now, and um, we had Pascal, who was um, an EMT, and he's he was a regular. Hopefully, he comes back. Um, and um, Sam Sherlock also, uh, Alan's wife. So we generally are are uh, well equipped with people with uh, medical knowledge. Good, good. Um, and we have a first aid kit, which you know is it? <laughs> is it? It's not a huge deal. And, you know, we have insurance as well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, um, we could we could be more prepared for that, though. So I will take that into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, and um, we can take it offline if, if you've got questions for me. Uh, for those wondering, I've been trying to join HEMA for some time, and I was about ready, and then the pandemic happened. Um, I moved to Bucks County from New Jersey. I'm a hobbyist fight choreographer, a uh, former stuntman in my younger years. Uh, I ran the fight stunts for the New Jersey Renaissance Festival and Kingdom. I also did uh, uh, fight choreography direction and stunts for a couple of shows at some of the conventions in New Jersey. Um, I don't want to mention them because the guy organizing several of them is a jerk. But um, I have a background on that side of the fence. I'm trying to get into the realistic element as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to trading blows and quips with everybody and enjoying your company. Yeah, we're Welcome, Ron. Thank Can you. I make a suggestion, Welcome. Steve? <laughs> Thank you very much. Tony? And, uh, as yeah. for being in the heat, um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that in June. <laughs> In 105 degree weather, hmm. fainting never again. No thanks. <laughs> Tony, do you have something? Yeah. So one thing to say, you could take a page from uh, my previous employer, where they just asked anybody with any medical training, first aid, CPR certification, any medical degrees, medical experience, and just basically, they had kind of a. a a sign up sheet somewhere to basically list off people who had any sort of uh, training so that they would just know like who to call and 
Uh, so that might be something to consider if you just had a sheet where people could just, you know, sign up and say, you know, that they had any sort of training and what their experience was so that we would, the club would just know that. It's a good idea. I would also encourage, can people hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I would also encourage like uh, people who come more regularly. Again, I know several people already have training and more extensive training and so on and so forth, but everyone should at least have some knowledge of like first aid and whatnot, especially if they're doing this on their own at home. I mean, they should be able to, uh, they should be feel comfortable that if like they slip or whatnot, they'd be able to take care of little things and whatnot. So, yeah. But of course, for new people, so be it. That's fine. Completely understandable. Um, but people who pl who plan on doing this more long term should invest in, you know, a first aid class. Uh, maybe even more if they see fit. Yeah, that's a good point. Hey, Steve. That actually uh, makes me think of something. Is there an AED in this park? Just like. Ooh out of curiosity in case, I mean, cause like uh, Ron was saying in the middle of summer with the heat and yeah. you know, wacky things happening. Yeah, there was definitely one in the gym, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. Um, it's not something that I have specifically looked for, so I don't know, but there, I mean, okay. there's buildings there, so it's possible. I can yeah, find I out. Yeah. What was the name of the park again? I'll see if I can find anything online. Um, Pamanen Park, Southampton. Yeah. I'll type if it in there, the chat. If there is one, that's something that, like, if there is one there, that's just something that we should all be aware of where it is, if it exists. And if there's not, that's also something we should be aware of. Yeah. Very true. Our safety record has been, knock on wood, pretty good thus far. So, but yeah, I mean, injury is always a possibility. All right, any other uh, questions or comments or just general whatever. Um, I had a quick question. I know I saw the post on Facebook about a little bit ago with regards to requirement of vaccination for meeting in person. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't seen any more information and I will admit it's been a little while since I looked at it. Um, do you mind just refreshing real quick exactly what requirements you are looking for for going forward with regards to that? Yeah. Vaccines required. Um, I don't think it's. Yeah, it's, that's that's pretty much it. Well, the quite well, it was more of like because I know most vaccines are done in multiple doses. Do you does someone need to be fully vaccinated? Yeah. Um, at least one shot. Okay. Cool. Fully, yeah. Two shots. Um, and yeah, I've been thinking about. Well, no, I haven't been thinking about it. And we'll wear masks during practice as well. I know I've heard some things about uh, masks outdoors not being necessary unless you're in a large group. And our group won't necessarily be large, but we will be breathing in each other's faces. So I think that counts as even a few people would count as a larger group in that case, in my head at least. And I'm the one that makes the rules, so that's how it's going to be. <laughs> I think we found last summer that much to my surprise, at least that wearing a face mask while you're sparring was not as onerous as I thought it was. That's true. Yeah. Maybe the first couple times it's kind of annoying, but like you get used to it pretty fast and yeah. if I could offer a piece of advice, um, 
you should probably bring more than one because once once you start sweating in it, then it does become really difficult to breathe in. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to waterboard yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's what Harry <laughs> called it. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Also, make especially if you're if you have a like if you have a dedicated mask for it and whatnot, make sure that you're washing them because uh, I can only imagine how bad they would get after one or two sparring or one sparring session that's not that they're not washed. Yeah, all good points. I've been using the uh, um, absolute force, absolute fencing. Um, sells a fencing specific mask which i've been using it's like mm. it's lightweight material and comes with like a filter so it's pretty cool but you definitely don't need to do that any mask will work it's just some might be a little bit more annoying under a mask under a fencing mask than others So anything else? I'm going to miss story time. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to say, lie, like, I want to find a way to just be able to shout story time again. That's all <laughs> I need. <laughs> it sounds like a tradition I'll enjoy. I'm not even sure what it's about yet. Oh. Well, story time <laughs> in the, uh, in the previous class, we would always do, so between warm-ups and drills, we would do story time in which I would read a uh, passage from our source. Ooh. And it would take like maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And I don't know, I just think we can practice in that time instead. And I don't think anybody really like retained any of the any of the reading. <laughs> I think people kind of just sat there. <laughs> well, I'm 50, so I can claim senility, but uh, that does sound uh, like it'd be pretty good. Maybe yeah. some of the shorter passages to start, see if it works. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. This was really quite fascinating since it's so different from how I've been taught martial arts in the past. I think this is going to be a really cool thing to test out and try, and I'm looking forward to seeing it in action. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, this is exactly, I think, over the past year or so what I've been looking for. Because as I've been studying more and more, I'm doing less and less of the fancy techniques and worry more and more about doing the basic stuff well. Mm. So I think this this um, is the nice solution to that. Yeah, you're part of my inspiration for doing this or for like changing the uh, class, Tony, because you seemed to get better faster when you were just sparring and not actually uh doing the drills so steve i have a prediction Go ahead. I, I think this i think this is going to stick right away I, I think it's i think it's going to work brilliantly i hope so i really hope so i mean, <laughs> I, I mean it, it may it may take um it may take a little bit of time for people to kind of get in a groove and you know like um really really uh put this on and wear it comfortably but i don't think it's going to take long and i i think you'll be very pleased I do hope so. I hope that's the way it goes. I mean, nothing ever works perfectly the first time in this. It's, it's, it's always an iterative process. When I first started the club, it probably took me about six months before I was kind of comfortable with where the club was. So hopefully it won't take as long this time, but it is an iterative process. Also, just wanted to say it's really good hearing everyone's voices. It's thanks, really Cameron. good hearing everyone's voices. Same to you, Cameron. Yeah, thanks. Cam. Cam, I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens. My I'm, I'm Zoom name I'm is still my old name, so yeah. it's stuck. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, I'm so out of touch with everybody and everything, but yeah. I miss everyone. Yeah, same. It, it has been a year since we've caught Croc Steel, so it's uh, <laughs> getting reminiscent at this point. Yeah, we're we're trying tram, but some of us are old. I appreciate all of you anyway. It means a ton that you even try. Yeah, thanks everybody for showing up too. We got a good turnout here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. This it it's very uh, it's fascinating to me. I love the concepts. I the drills look great um, that you posted on YouTube. So it's very exciting. Yeah, and thanks for thanks also for just putting in the the legwork and the study and basically all you do to just try and help us improve as fighters. It's 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 incredibly appreciated. You are a fantastic leader and teacher. All oh, shucks, Casey. All oh, shucks. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I guess I'm going to. Um, I'll end it here. I'll uh, end the recording here. I'll post the recording. Anybody who wants to. Um, <laughs>